Hello and welcome to our midweek Bible study. I'm so happy that you joined us. For the past seven weeks, we've been looking at the seven distinct churches found in Revelations chapter two and three. I don't know about you, but I've learned a lot throughout these few weeks, things that I never had perhaps seen before. And this afternoon, we continue and conclude looking at the seventh and final church, the church of Laodicea. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Revelations chapter 3. Revelations chapter 3, and we're going to look at starting in verse 14. And it says, And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed in that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and that you anoint your eyes with eyes out, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in with him and dine with him and he with me. But to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also have overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the Lord, to the churches. Let us bow our heads for the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much that you allow us once again to study your word, that you reveal to us your son, Jesus Christ, and that through these seven distinct churches, we have been summoned to let our light shine. God, we thank you for your word today. We ask that you bless us now as we study it, as we look through it, as we glean through your scripture. Lord, we just ask that your blessing be upon us. All these things in Jesus' precious name, amen. Like I said earlier, for the past seven weeks, we've been looking at the distant, distinct shades of what the church has gone through. And let me just say that as we learn together, we saw the churches in their ups and their lows. We saw churches facing persecution and also facing heresies. We saw churches triumphant and we saw churches trudging along. But what about the seventh church? What about the last church? We've always said that when Jesus speaks to these seven churches, it's in the backdrop of what we saw in Revelation chapter one where Jesus is standing in the midst of these seven lampstands. We saw Jesus being covered with the light of these churches. We started by saying that the, the reason why we believe that uh, Jesus was speaking is he's reminding these seven churches that one, they belong to him. Believe it or not, you know, no matter how difficult or, or how bad the situation was, Jesus never forsake his church. Jesus never said, I'm done with you. I'm closing the door. No one can back, come back in. Here we find Jesus like he did in the Old Testament, calling out, calling out, showing their sins, but at the same time with that same hand asking for them to repent. Here we find Jesus telling the church, you are my church. And two, you are to light the world with my glory. You are to show and reveal my love and my mercy. You are to, to tell people of who I am and what I am about to do. Because we see that in the book of Revelation, that it is the unveiling of Jesus. In the time of the apostles, all the way clear up to the time when Jesus was to return back. Here we find Jesus telling them, one, you are my church. Two, you need to light the world with my glory. And three, and this is the most important one, you need to keep watch. You need to be vigilant. 
Because if there's one thing that we see in all of these churches is each of them, each of these churches needed to be vigilant. Otherwise, their light would be taken away. So here's the thing that I want us to look at in the church of Laodicea. What was the city like? What were the people like in Laodicea? Well, some scholars believe that the, the city of, of Laodicea lie 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia and 40 miles east of Ephesus. The city of Laodicea was uh, the greatest commercial financial, one of the greatest commercial financial centers of the world. Just to tell you, it had so much gold, it had accumulated so much wealth that when it had one of its own natural disasters, a massive earthquake in AD 60, the city of Laodicea didn't even ask one cent from the Roman authorities to reconstruct its, its buildings and its city. It self-sustained itself to revamp and reconstruct the city to which it had been laid in ruins. The other thing that it was known for, it was known for its glossy black uh, wool. It was world renowned. People came to Laodicea to find this special, almost unique, glassy black wool. The other thing that it was known for, it had a medical school. There people from all around the world would come to find information and cures to all eye treatments. It was world renowned and it had this, this Figurian powder that was used to heal, to, to restore the sight of those who were ill because of their eyes. We see all these characteristics being mentioned later and Jesus telling them, I know who you are. What I see in the church of Laodicea is that God is looking like through a, a, a microscope, seeing each of the churches in their distinct features and calling them out and making sure that if, if someone was to read the letter, they wouldn't be saying, well, this is just a general statement. This is just talking to you know, the general public. No, Jesus uses key terms and, and key words that only the people of that distinct city would know what he's talking about. But let's go back to, Je to Revelations chapter three. And let's look at the prologue. Let's look at how Jesus addresses himself to this church. Verse 14, and to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation. Here Jesus introduces himself distinct from the other six churches and he's saying, I am the amen. I am the faithful witness. I am true. What Jesus knew here was that every person that read this would understand that Jesus' testimony has been verified. Jesus' testimony of who he is and what he was has been sustained throughout centuries. Yes, people can question uh, Jesus' uh, divinity. Yes, people can question uh, people uh, Jesus' uh, crucifixion and resurrection. But what people have not denied is the historical person that existed 2,000 years ago. Without a shadow of doubt, a man came from Nazareth and changed and revolutionized the world completely. We as Christians and Seventh-day Adventists believe that Jesus came to this world, died for our place, rose from the dead, and as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that our purpose in life is to shine that the same Jesus that came is coming back again. Brothers and sisters, as we see in scriptures, Jesus is affirming us as Seventh-day Adventists. Yes, we need to believe that one, the Bible is true, and that two, Jesus is coming back again. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, every time I listen to the news, every time I watch the evening news, I, rem I, re I am reminded once again that Jesus is coming and that his words are true. He is the amen, the faithful and true witness. The second thing we see that Jesus uses as his prologue, prologue is the beginning of creation. Jesus is saying in full circle, it started with me and it will end with me. One pastor told me that if you look at from cover to cover, the main 
character is Jesus. If you look from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22, you will find time and time again that Jesus is the center. He is the beginning and the end. He is the beginning of the creation. But here's what he says in verse 15. I know your works. Six times he's addressed each distinct church by saying, I know your works. Basically, I know who you are. You can pretend, you can, you can say, but I know the truth. I am the true and faithful witness. I see beyond the disguises. And here he says, you are. This is very powerful because what Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, he cuts through all the fluff. And he says, you are. And we know what he says. Here we find the first impression of the church of Laodicea. Here we find the church being confronted with the truth. You are. But sometimes first impressions, they say, are the lasting impressions. But when you get to know a person, you realize they are not who you first assume them to be. Case in point, reminds me of when I first met my wife. When I first met my wife, we were studying at, at the University of Montemorelos. And it was an evening, and I remember clearly a uh, few of my friends and I wanted to go out to eat. And there at the university, there's one, only one entrance and one exit. And so we all decided that we wanted to go out to eat that evening. And we were exiting, uh, and just at that precise moment, there is a young girl walking in front of us. Now, I was walking with three other guys, and one of them recognized this young girl and said, Hey, Lisette. And that's when I first set eyes on my wife. At that time, I didn't know who she was. All I could perceive in my first impression was that she was really young. I was 20 years old, and I was in, in college, and I was with this mindset different. And I saw this young woman, and I thought, man, she looks like she's 14. So I quickly dismissed any idea of trying to make any kind of contact with her because I figured this is not what you want to do. You know, you don't want to uh, introduce yourself to a 14 year old. So I quickly just dismissed it. I saw that she was young. I didn't care much about it. And as they were talking, I started to get annoyed because I was so hungry. I just wanted to go out to eat. And my friend was trying to make small talk with her and I was like, Bro, just, you know, cut the fluff and let's just keep going. And, and I remember cutting in between my wife and my friend and I turned to him and I'm like, bro, just like, come on, like, let's go. That was my first impression. My wife, on the other hand, thought the complete opposite. She thought I was the worst. She, was, she thought I was a jerk. She thought I was super rude. And at the time, I didn't think nothing of it. All I cared for was where we were going to eat. First impressions sometimes are the lasting impressions. A few weeks later, I ran into my wife, this time in the library, and her hair was down. She was wearing this really nice white dress with green, green flowers on it. And I was just like, wow, who is that? And the same friend that I had walked with that evening said, he, she's the girl that I introduced you to. And I was like, wait, what? And the rest is history. Here we find that Jesus is saying to the church, you are, and what does he say? You are neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm. Historians believe that there was an aqueduct that would lead the water into Laodicea. Unfortunately, Laodicea did not have its own water source, so it had to receive water from outside. But by the time the water reached the city of Laodicea, it had, been, it had gone through all the different uh, temperatures. By the time it reached, when it was cool from the mountains, by the time it was reaching the city, it was lukewarm. It was known that people did not drink out of the city, out of the water, city water. So when Jesus uses this term lukewarm, they knew what he was referring to. And when he uses the term, I will vomit you out of my mouth, we can only imagine what that looks like. This disgust, this disdain, this, this wah, you know. But what he's saying is, I wish you were one or the other. 
I wish you were cold. I wish you were hot. But because you are the mixture. And it's interesting when you look at this church, compared to the other seven churches, or compared to the other six churches, there is no persecution. There is no one character. And one we saw the Nicolotians, and the other one we saw those who followed Jezebel. But here, there is no arch enemy. The arch enemy is this lukewarmness, this, this symptom. But as you will cl clearly see in just a minute, this lukewarmness comes from the comfortable lifestyle. Because what we see in, in, in the church of Laodicea, it was not facing persecution. It was not facing heresy. It was facing a comfortable life. And this is where many people fall into the trap of lukewarmness. Because contrary to other churches, they were not persecuted. But believe it or not, they too, like the church of Ephesus, were losing their first love. They were losing that passion, that excitement for serving God and knowing God. Because this is the danger when all things are going right. Come with me to the book of Deuteronomy, to the Old Testament. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we will find what Moses said to the people after they were going to reach Canaan. Listen to what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. He says, Because that you do not forget the Lord your God by, by not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them. He's telling them, when you get to a point where your house is nice, your cars are nice, your bank account is nice, when your health is good, he says, when you dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. God understood through his prophet Moses that there would come a time where God's people would reach a level of comfortness, would we reach a level of security that they would forget. Listen to what he says in verse 16. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna and with your father's did not know that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good in the end. Because here is what we find in the church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea was a lukewarm church that had everything or supposedly had everything. But listen to what he says in verse 18, 17. And you say in your heart, by my power and by my might have gained me this wealth. The problem of the church of Laodicea, it was a self-sustained church. It believed that it had accomplished greatness because of its own resources, because of its own membership, because of its own smartness and, 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 and strategic planning. We've said this, brothers and sisters. You can have the most charismatic pastor. You can have the most beautiful temple. But unless you have the Holy Spirit, those are all things that will pass away. They hold no worth. They hold no value in God's eyes. What he values the most is those who are humble, who have a contrite spirit, who seek God for who he is and genuinely repent and realize their desperate need for him. And we see in the church of Laodicea, they didn't have that. On the contrary, they looked at themselves almost as better than any other. And yes, we know that throughout history, the six distinct churches fit in perfectly to a grand plan of the early church. And we believe that the church of Laodicea represents God's final church right before his second coming. We live in a country that has all the freedoms, though we might see uh, differently in political views, but we see that we have the liberty to worship God, 
We have the liberty to, to come together to have these services. In some countries, it is not allowed. In some countries, it's forbidden. Even in some countries, it's punished by death. But here in our country, we have these liberties. And yet, people have taken advantage of these liberties to say, I'm not interested in God. God doesn't exist. God is just a crutch. Why do we need the Bible? Why do we need rules? And here we find in Revelations chapter 3 what the lukewarmness does. He says, because you say in verse 6, 17, Revelations 3, 17, he says, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Here is the true symptom. Here is the true nature of what happens when you're lukewarm. Because when you're lukewarm, you don't feel compelled to do anything. Because things are so great, things are so perfect, you could just put your hands behind your back, cross your legs and keep drinking your iced tea. Is this the kind of Christianity we have? Yes. Ellen White said when she was comparing the life of Solomon in Prophets and Kings, page 60, she talked about Solomon, and I want to just read you these words. It says, In the midst of prosperity lurks danger. Throughout the ages, riches and, uh, riches and honor have ever been attended with peril to humility and spirituality. It is not the empty cup that we have difficulty in carrying. That we have difficulty in carrying. It is the cup full to the brim that must be careful, balance, and affliction and adversity may cause sorrow, but it's prosperity that is most dangerous. To spiritual life, unless the human subject is in constant submission to the will of God, unless he is sanctified by the truth, prosperity will surely arise, arouse the natural inclination to presumption. There's a lot of stuff she just said. But the one part that really captivates my attention is she says, it is not the empty cup that we have difficulty in carrying, but it is the cup full to the brim that must be carefully balanced. A church, a brand new church, with so much potential in a large metropolitan area of the city. A church with all the potential, a, a beautiful gymnasium and a, a parking lot full of potential. is a church that has all the merits to do great things. But it's in the prosperity that we must be more careful than ever. Brothers and sisters, I don't deny that God had a plan for this pandemic. I believe that God sifted through all this and made it possible for us to realize what are the priorities of our church? What are the priorities of our lives? For so many people, it was work. It was pleasures. It was, you know, different lifestyles. And now we're brought to the core. What is the core of us? And here Jesus is telling the church of Laodicea, because you think you have it all, you think that because your lifestyle is so perfect, you are far from danger. On the contrary, this is the time where you need to react. This is the time where you need to realize that you're closer to the danger than ever before. Because he says these things. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You are. We see that. Jesus is telling the church, you are. But he's also saying, this is what's going to happen if you don't see what I see. Because lukewarmness is not a symptom. It's a destination. Lukewarmness is not something that you can point to. It's a place where you are. Because this is the part where most people misunderstand. 
The lukewarmness is not something that, you know, you can just give a peel. No, it's a place where you are standing. And unless, unless you move, you will be a part of those who will not take, who will not last. Because there in lukewarmness is the church who says you have it all. You have all the truth. You have all, all the, the necessary means to be successful. Because there, a church that is lukewarm is, eh, they don't fear anything. They don't worry about anything. And they all believe that life is good. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is calling out to us as a church of Laodicea to see where we are. We must at this time be humbling ourselves, asking God to examine our lives, to see what areas in our personality, in our character that we need to change. God is looking for a church that looks to him as their only resource, as their only source of life. But Jesus gives them this advice. I counsel that you buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich and white with white garments, that you may be clothed with the shame of your nakedness, may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye self that you may be seen. Here, God says, buy from me. Look to me for your true source. Look to me as your purpose in life. It's interesting that when you find this phrase, you can easily look and see the comparison to Isaiah chapter 55. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 55 and listen to what God says through his prophet Isaiah. He says, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages that does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight in its unabundance. Incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you and the sure mercies of David. God is saying the same thing. Come and buy from me. Why do you waste your money? Why do you, you spend your money on things that don't fulfill your life, that don't give you meaning? Here God is telling the church of Laodicea, just because you think you really not, but now I'm telling you, buy from me and I will give you three things. And he says, I will give you gold refined in fire. I will give you a robe of white of uh, 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 so that you can cover your nakedness. And three, I will give you eyesight so that you can see how wretched you are. These three things can clearly be, when we look at the eye self, it's the revealing of who you are. Here God is promising his Holy Spirit, who is the one who will, who will open up the areas of our lives to show us where we need to confess. Two, it says that he is going to give us what? Gold refined in fire. Peter says that this gold refined in fire is the same thing as faith. God is going to increase your faith. And three, the robe of whiteness. This is the same thing as the robe of righteousness. God is covering over our sins, not with our sins. He's covering it with his righteousness. And when we stand before God, when our name goes before God, he sees Jesus and he does not see us. When we look at the church of Laodicea, we are reminded of what a church can be and unfortunately what a church can lead to. If we are not careful, if we are not careful, we can fall into the church who is barely getting by. Why? Because they're so comfortable. They're so at ease. And here we find what Jesus says. As many as I love, I rebuke. This is Revelations 3.19. And chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. 
That word for zealous in the original uh, Greek can also be be hot. Remember Jesus had just said either be cold or hot. Jesus knows that he desires from us for us to be zealous, for us to be heated, to, for us to be hot. But here's what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, dine with him, and he with me. Jesus is promising those who, who are victorious a meal. But it's interesting that we saw in the church of Philadelphia, he uses the term door. He says, I will open a door that no man can shut. But here he uses the term, I will knock at a door. Does God not have the power to go through the door? Of course he does. Does God not have the power to go through the door? Of course he does. But here we find Jesus being the gentleman that he is, that he is knocking. He is not forcing his way into our hearts. He is not forcing his way into our lives. No, he's knocking. And he's knocking through the pandemic of the coronavirus. He's knocking through the door of the social injustice that we see and the rioting. He is knocking so that you and I can hear his voice and allow him into our lives. Brothers and sisters, we all want to go to heaven. If I was to ask you how many of us want to go to heaven, we would all raise our hand. But the question that I further ask is, how many of us are living a life that is according to that decision? How many of us are living our lives with this anticipation that we want to live in heaven? Because this is not our world. Yes, we can fight for the liberties of other people, but ultimately, this is not where we want to live. But we must demonstrate the kingdom principles found in the Sermon on the Mount. We must demonstrate what it looks like to be Christ-like. And brothers and sisters, even though this does not have anything to do with the Church of Laodicea, it does. Because here we have seven distinct churches whose sole responsibility is to light and to reveal God's unending and unconditional love. Right now, what we see around us is a church who is self-consumed, who is only looking to its own benefits and forgetting the purpose of why we are lampstands is to shine. We are not to shine at us. We are to shine at the world, to reveal to the world God's unending love. So I conclude with this. The church of Laodicea is left with an open, an open door. We don't know how these churches end. We don't see John speaking about the churches afterwards. But we conclude this story. And my prayer for you and my prayer for me is that we can be hearing God's voice and allowing him to come in. Because when we do, Jesus is not going to come in and, and start pointing fingers and saying, why do you have this and why do you do this and why do you... No, no, no. On the contrary, we see a loving Savior coming in and dining and eating with us. So brothers and sisters, my challenge for you is this. Let your light shine. Show Jesus to the world, especially in these dark days. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you for the seven distinct churches, the seven different shades of what a church looks like and what a church has gone through. And yes, though it, it is afflicted and persecuted, God, it is not ever abandoned. And so, Father, we thank you for what you are doing in the lives of our church and on the lives of our church members. We are challenged today, God, that we must let our light shine now more than ever. This is the time where the church needs to stand up and say, no more darkness, because we need to show God's love, God's care, and God's compassion. So Father, please restore in us this true desire. Show in us the I self that we can see how wretched we truly are, and that you can cover us in your robe of righteousness. So we thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you again. May God richly bless you.